The end of 2007 saw the release of graphics cards offering 8800 GTX performance at a much more appealing price point. However, besides this reduction in price, we saw no more power available to us in a single package. This was of course up until AMD released the HD 3870X2. Its most powerful GPUs bolted together in the most elegant and compact way that had never been seen before. The card itself contains two Radeon HD 3870s, a card we checked out in the early days of the channel, but it does offer some minor changes compared to that of a standard HD 3870. The core comes clocked in slightly higher, 825 MHz, but the VRAM has been swapped out for the slower GDDR3 variant so that they could undercut the competition price-wise. However, it also comes clocked in at 900 MHz, so the difference there is negligible. As for process, it comes based on the 55nm lithography, and it still comes complete with a total of 640 stream processors. The TDP is a moderate 225 watts, which may sound like a lot, but in the grand scheme of things was remarkably powerful compared to other high-powered solutions of the time. This is supplied with a 6 and an 8-pin power connector to allow some overclocking should you opt to go down that route. Our car today doesn't seem to have been cleaned since it's released 9 years ago, so we're going to have to get this thing open and some clean thermal paste put on it. Now this thing has a lot of screws as the cooling system is one of the largest and best reference designs that I've ever seen. The large blower design and hefty heat sinks on the front and back really add to the cooling power of it. Now clearly the thermal paste on this chip was if anything too thick. It was very dry around the centre of the chip, with excess amounts slowly going onto the rest of the PCB. Luckily a small bit of solvent spray got all of it off. As you may have noticed, the card has two GPU dies. These are connected by a large PCI Express bridge that you can see in the middle so that all communication is kept internal and quick. It allows it to be used in any kind of motherboard with this kind of system, as some motherboards of the time and ones today don't support Crossfire or SLI. So with that all cleaned up and some fresh thermal paste put on it, I went straight and put it back together. But unfortunately I forgot the back plate, so I had to take it all apart and put it back together for a second time. And at last it's time to get this thing into my PC and get on with some benchmarks. Up first we have Grand Theft Auto 5 which is running the 720p resolution with the medium option selected. We saw averages of 36 frames per second for the vast amount of gameplay and it scaled amazingly well across both our cards and we had no issues running it. Our minimums did hit 28 frames per second when a lot was going on but this was likely due to the lack of driver side optimizations. Up next we have Battlefield 4 which is running in the 1080p resolution with a 75% render scale and a mixture of low and medium settings. We saw averages of 48 FPS when a lot was going on on a heavily populated server, and the game did dip down to lows of 31 FPS when there was a lot of heavy action going on, but for the most part of the game it was very playable. CSGO also scaled exceptionally well with averages of 81 FPS and lows down to 62 FPS when the lot was going on. This was all in the 1080p resolution with a mixture of low and medium settings as usual. As for a Bethesda game, we tried out the Elder Scrolls Skyrim which maintained a steady average of 58 frames per second and lows down to 45 FPS when there was a lot of heavy scenery to load in. The game rolls around in 1080p with a mixture of medium and high settings. Moving on to Far Cry 3, which is also a great experience on the card, with a mixture of low and medium settings in the 1080p resolution. The game was running flawlessly with averages of 63 FPS, and eventually dropping down to 58 FPS when there was a lot of explosions and stuff going on. There was no stuttering, even in heavy combat. Even games like Payday 2 averaged a steady 38 FPS, but the game did suffer from stuttering when a match was started. This stopped rather quickly, however this has been shown as the minimum of 0 FPS, and within about 20 seconds of your game starting, it should be back to playing normally. So in conclusion, should you buy this card? Well, it's certainly something pretty cool to buy, and is a piece of AMD's history into the graphics card market. 
Crossfire seems to be pretty stable on it, and as my first experience with using two cards technically, it worked fine. Even in games where Crossfire isn't supported, you'll still see a boost thanks to that higher clock speed that the card has. But practicality wise, you may as well opt for something like a single card HD 4890 if you're on a tight budget, as they really are one of the better cards from this era, as not only will it use less power, but drivers will become less of an issue. Thank you very much for watching this video. Good night! And if you enjoyed this video, please do like and subscribe for more content like it. We have a 1000 subscriber special coming up, so please do stay tuned for that, and thank you to all of you for your support so far. Thank you.